the anti-publicists feared that the unlearned, by bare reading of the law without the training of the inns of court, might suck out errors and thus end damage themselves. When the people know what the exact laws are, they do not stand in awe of their superiors. Yes. Yes, that is the point. When the law is available to everyone, there is a different level of equality achieved, don't you think? This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. If you were one of the precious few that actually watched this morning's video, we covered this. We covered the Supreme Court, State of Georgia versus public.resource.org. And I promised that we would read more of this R Street, Wikimedia, and Public Knowledge brief. So let's just go straight into it because it's, it's a really remarkable brief. It talks about origins of law. It talks about ancient history and all that. And normally that stuff would be very uninteresting, but uh, I, I've, I've, I've been told that this is actually quite interesting. If it turns out to be dry as heck and boring, I will cut it short or ask Brandon to severely edit it down. Let's just see how far we get through this. So the public knowledge brief st argument starts. In the arc of history, Georgia's annotated code is not unusual. Remember, this is annotated code. This is this is the code has been added to. It's not just the black letter law, but also comments, suggestions, recommendations, history, annotations in the law. History is replete with sovereigns propounding annotated codes, official commentaries, and other non-binding pronouncements, consideration of which is instructive not just on the disposition of this case, but also on the basic theories of liberty and government. In Rome, official commentaries were jus scripta from the Republic through Justinian. The Roman Republic and Empire repeatedly treated official, though non-binding, commentaries as a component of the law and valued promulgation of both. As early as 450 BC, the Roman Republic publicized the famed Law of the Twelve Tables, inscribed in bronze and posted in the public square, thereby quelling a threatened class war arising from the complaint on the part of the plebs that the law was an affair of mystery. In 304 BC, a court clerk named Gnaeus Flavius, they might, would they have pronounced the G? Gnaeus Flavius? They may have. Became a local hero by leaking the Roman pontiff's secret interpretations of the Twelve Tables, winning him high political offices. Emphasis on publicizing law developed into the Roman concept of jus scripta, written law that held a place higher than unwritten customary law, or what we would call common law, although it is written, it's written in case precedent. Customary law, which is called jus, jus non scripta, Jus scripta was not just statutes, though. Among other things, it encompasses the Senate's opinions, the Senatus Consulta, which at least during the Republic were treated as non-binding commentary on statutes. It could not annul a lex. It could, however, interpret enactments of the proper assembly. Nevertheless, Senatus Consulta weighed heavily on judges and magistrates ignored them at their peril. Then in dynastic China, or dynastic as in dynasty, dynastic China, official annotations were intertwined with the statutory law. Like Rome, historical China treated official annotations as integral components of the law, meriting promulgation to the same extent as statutes. In other words, spreading or copying was allowed as, this, to this, as the same extent as statutes, as the written law. China has favored promulgation of law since at least the legalist Confucian debates spanning the late spring and autumn period, 591 to 450. 53 BC, the legalist school preferred efficient, predictable government under published laws. By contrast, the Confucians eschewed written law in favor of Li, or virtue, theorizing that written laws would encourage mere compliance rather than moral perfection. I, I don't know, <laughs> lowest common denominator is what I think would happen there. Is it would be even worse if you had to uh, do it without the written law. It would encourage lots of uh, prejudice in favor of people you liked, and then the law would be suddenly more difficult for people to, to comply with if, if, if the judges didn't like you. 
The legalists prevailed as early as 536 BC when the Kingdom of Zheng publicly displayed its penal text cast onto three-legged vessels. A neighboring leader criticized the publication, saying, When the people know what the exact laws are, they do not stand in awe of their superiors. Yes. Yes, that is the point. When the law is available to everyone, there is a different level of equality achieved, don't you think? Indeed, Confucius himself is apocryphally said to have lamented people will study the tripods, the law, and not care to know their men of rank. In other words, the, the law men and the leaders would not be as important as the law. And yes, that's the point, because when you lose the rule of law, all that's left is the law of men. Nevertheless, the Chinese would publish legal codes for millennia, complete with official but non-binding commentary. So that's very interesting. That's also very much like our current case. England, non-binding English laws secure the crown authority. Throughout the history of England, official but non-binding pronouncements have been a critical component of the law even from the first days of printed matter. At the outset of printing in the late 15th century, the official language of English law was not English. Statutes were titled in Latin and officially written in so-called Law French. As exemplified by William de Maclenia's 1484 printing of Richard III's statute. When Henry VII took the throne in 1485, Parliament also produced statutes again officially in Law French. Yet when around 1490, the Crown commissioned William Caxton to print the statutes, Caxton did so in English. No doubt the lawyers of the time would have understood Caxton's translations, although emanations of the king as not law. In other words, translating the law into another language does not mean that you can use that new law in the new language as the official law. It has to be adopted by the legislature. The prevailing view was that law could be expressed more aptly in French than English, owing to the many technical terms of law in French. An English translation would have been considered not merely unofficial, but indeed ambiguous. Yet England made and promulgated these non-binding explanations of the law because doing so served important purposes. By informing the public on the law, the Crown hoped to instill virtue in its subjects and, selfishly, to propagandize its own majesty and justness. That required the law to be not just public, but understandable to the English subject. So this was a thing, if you keep it in a different language, then maybe the plebs <laughs> won't be able to understand it, and you'll be able to tell them what it is. Or your lawyers, or the lawyers, will be able to tell them how it is, and will be able to take advantage of more people. So it's very much kind of a class warfare kind of a thing, too. Not long after Caxton's publication, lawyer and printer John Rastell would deem Henry VII worthy to be called the Second Solomon by virtue of having the statutes written in the vulgar English tongue and to be published, declared, and imprinted so that then, universally, the people of the realm might soon have knowledge of said statutes. Perhaps the Georgia Code is not so arcane as Law French, but the terseness of statutes can make them opaque, absent interpretive aids. Both modern official annotations and 15th century Englishing of statutes offer a window into the legislator's reasoning. Neither can be disregarded as part of the law. So yes, if you are looking for Georgia law these days, and you find a third-party text that doesn't have the annotations, or you can't find a third-party text because it, you know, because it has the annotations, you have to go to Georgia's official copy of the code. Well, that there could be reasons why you might not be able to access that. Maybe Georgia has access restrictions. I've noticed that when I'm traveling in Luxembourg or Europe, sometimes I can't access. Uh, the Pennsylvania Unified Judicial System, for example, the P Pennsylvania UJS portal is inaccessible to me unless I log in through a VPN from the United States. If I'm outside the states, I cannot access Pennsylvania's law, or at least the, uh, the docketing system. So this could be something similar with Georgia. Maybe someone outside the state or outside the country or from certain IP address ranges or something can't access it, so they would need to find it someplace else. Certainly there's less of an access issue these days, but it is still 
an access to justice issue that the plebs, as I'll use from before, need, and I'm counting myself among them, believe it or not, uh, need to be able to read and understand the law. Uh, even I consider myself a pleb because when I go and read the law, I have difficulty with it and I have to figure out, for example, figuring out the financial law involved with Tanda Pay has been very difficult for me. It's, it's, it's very complicated. There's lots of laws that apply. You have to figure out which, how they conflict or don't conflict or complement one another and all that. And if I had a bunch of articles telling me how to interpret it, I would go there first and then try to trace it back to which laws I need to make sure I comply with. England again, this time promulgates explanations of law to counteract an absolutist monarchy. The printing press sparked a debate over the propriety of printing the law, a debate that reveals grave risks in restricting access to official but non-binding edicts of the government. The publicists supported printing the law of England in English to improve social morals. Lawyer, printer John Rastell, in praising the English translation of Henry VII's statutes and in printing his own translation of older statutes into that vulgar tongue, explained in 1519 that knowledge of the said statutes would allow people better to live in tranquility and peace. Politician turned poet Lord Brooke, after alluding to Gnaeus Flavius, wrote, Again, laws ordered must be and set down so clearly as each man may understand wherein for him and wherein for the crown their rigor or equality doth stand. Opponents of the publicists were primarily lawyers who stood to lose their monopoly over knowledge of the laws. The arguments of these anti-publicists illuminate why access to the law ought to encompass official annotations. The anti-publicists generally did not oppose publishing binding law, protesting instead publication of the reasoning behind the law. It is, quote, assuredly no matter of necessity to publish the reasons of judgment of the law or apices, fine point, or fictiones juris to the multitude, wrote one lawyer. Like the Confucians, the anti-publicists feared that the unlearned, by bare reading of the law without the training of the inns of court, might suck out errors and thus end damage themselves. Worse yet, miscreants could use knowledge of the law as shifts to cloak their wickedness rather than to gain understanding. In other words, they could figure out what the law says and then do just enough to not get in trouble but still be wicked. More selfishly, the anti-publicists feared that publishing the law would deny the bar the ability to characterize and evolve the law through in-guild decisions, insider decisions, and manuscript exchange norms, like peer-to-peer -peer review, that controlled the development of precedents. So lawyers could have more control over the law if you didn't know what it said. But the most important and insidious objection to the law being printed was one married uneasily to the larger debate over absolutist monarchy, presaging Georgia's treatment of its official code as the state's intellectual property, many anti-publicists supposed that because the crown was the sole fount of power, the law was its property. As such, there was no more need for the monarch to explain a law than for a parent to explain punishing a child. Hmm. England again, printing of parliamentary debates plants seeds of democracy. Publishing English parliamentary debates in the mid-1600s demonstrates how access to non-binding but official materials, in this case legislative history, fosters popular sovereignty and public representation. Parliament, even today, nominally holds the power to render its debates secret and to punish those who publish its proceedings. This is true. I have been told to be careful about publishing parliamentary proceedings. The parliamentary privilege of freedom of speech provides that debates or proceedings in Parliament ought not to be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of Parliament. The Houses of Parliament interpreted this liberty to entail a copyright-like power to prohibit anyone, even their own members, from publishing debates. Certainly, privilege was enforceable only by contempt, as the common law courts refused to apply and indeed disparaged the secrecy privilege, but contempt punishments 
could be severe. In 1581, the House of Commons charged its member Arthur Hall with publishing the conferences of this house abroad in print and sentenced him with expulsion and a fine of 500 marks, about $130,000 today, and six months imprisonment in the Tower of London. Nevertheless, a healthy industry of printing parliamentary debates began during the long parliament of 1640. Disregard of the privilege was flagrant. Members not only published their speeches, but occasionally registered them with the company of stationers. I'm guessing that's a copyright office for UK. A, apart from sanctions against Sir Edward Daring for publishing not just speeches, but also private conversations, parliamentary privilege was essentially unenforced during this period. It was a good thing, too, that printing of the debates flourished through the Long Parliament because promulgation of those debates arguably catalyzed modern participatory democracy. Prior to 1640, the average English subject petitioned Parliament not for public policy change, but for private grievances. But with publication of parliamentary debates, an informed public could understand and engage in the political process. Political discourse in printed text encouraged readers to interpret conflict between king and parliament, and subsequently among parliamentary factions as an ongoing debate. In particular, printed political debates allowed for a new form of petitioning parliament in which proponents of change could stir up support by presenting and critiquing the speeches of members. Printing parliamentary debates thus gave rise to public opinion as a political force. Great Britain again, this time New York in the 1700s. Suppression of debate printing sparks demand for freedom of speech. Debate printing in the next century had starker impacts in America, it instigated freedom of the press. When English newspapers began printing parliamentary debates in the mid-1700s, the House of Commons remarkably did exercise its privilege. In 1762, Commons imprisoned the printer of the London Chronicle for printing a speech of the Speaker, deterring further printing of debates for several years. The 1768 Middlesex election affair reinvigorated debate reporting and Parliament again tried to block it. In what came to be called the Printer's Case of 1771, the House of Commons, led by its member Colonel George Oslo, summoned eight newspaper printers for contempt of privilege by printing debates. Most confessed and made contrition on their knees, but John Miller, publisher of the London Evening Post, refused to appear. Commons sent for his arrest, but was thwarted by the Lord Mayor of London, Brass Crosby, who asserted sole jurisdiction for arrests in the city. In an infamous move that triggered days of protests, the House of Commons, frustrated with Crosby for protecting Miller, threw the Lord Mayor into the Tower of London instead. Holy shikies! It is easy to imagine how parliamentary censorship in 1771 might have influenced revolutionary era American thinking on liberty and speech. There is considerable evidence of that. The Virginia Gazette predicted that the present dispute about the liberty of the press will in all probability give a mortal wound to the arbitrary power. A week later, it ran an open letter of the pseudonymous English polemicist Junius excoriating Parliament's actions. Benjamin Franklin knew of the incident, as did Samuel Adams, who called the affair a stretch of arbitrary power. Americans celebrated John Wilkes, the London alderman who helped orchestrate the showdown between Parliament and the printers for championing freedom of the press. Americans continued to find parliamentary privilege antithetical to their principles. One member of Congress declared that congressional debates were offered to the public view and held up to the inspection of the world. And when in 1796, the New York Assembly jailed newspaper writer William Ketelkus for a breach of the privileges by reporting a debate, among his supporters was Camillius Junius, a pseudonym that surely recalls the 1771 English episode. There is little daylight between parliamentary privilege and copyright when it comes to a legislator suppressing publication of non-binding yet official pronouncements. In both cases, the state levies powerful, even criminal remedies against its citizens for publicizing information crucial to the public dialogue. History has denounced state-asserted privilege as contrary to freedoms of speech and press. State-asserted copyright ought to fare no better. 
then in Virginia in 1846 to 1887. Although the states of America have been making legal codes since before they were states, interest in codification accelerated in the mid-1800s, a result of successes of the Napoleonic Code Seville and lobbying by Jeremy Bentham. Some of the resulting codes were annotated, such as Alabama's 1852 code, for which the General Assembly directed a suitable person to make headnotes to the titles, chapters, and articles. Headnotes is a legal term for notes that come just before a legal brief. You would normally write these yourself, or you might pay a service like LexisNexis or Westlaw to write these for you, and they're very good at them. And you'd read it, and you'd see that they're, you know, what categories of law and what holdings in each category this case stands for. It's kind of like a professional legal summary before you get to the actual law. It's very important, and it is very helpful. For lawyers who are practicing regularly, it is essential that they have these kinds of annotations. So think one step further then, if only the lawyers who are paying hundreds of dollars a month or equivalent uh, have access to these summaries, then what about you when you can't afford a lawyer? Or what about you when you can't afford a lawyer so they appoint you a public defender who can't afford several hundred dollars a month for access to Westlaw or Nexus? Now, I'm sure that public defenders do have access to Westlaw or Nex Alexis Nexus, but imagine if now it's a civil thing where you don't get a free attorney. You have, to, you have to hire whatever attorney you can afford, and maybe an attorney like Leonard French, who doesn't practice in you know a regular way where I'm doing legal research on different topics of law every day, maybe I don't need to spend three or four or five hundred dollars a month or more for Westlaw or LexisNexis. And so does somebody who hires me for that get the same? N no. And, and so when Georgia hires was it Lexis, to write their annotated code. Does Georgia get to make the annotated code only available to people it likes? No, it's supposed to be available to everybody. And then one step further, can they copyright it so that at least they can key, only keep it on their website and nobody else can copyright it? So we're gonna stop there. That's the brief of public knowledge that we covered this morning on 1017. Um, but there was more to it. I wanted to go over some of that history with you. And rather than make uh, you know, one video that much longer, thought we would bring you some of this history here. So now none of that history is necessarily binding legal precedent. But what they're doing is trying to show the court that throughout history, democracies, freedoms of speech, all benefited from the publicizing of not just the law, but the official annotations surrounding the law. And I'm, I'm firmly on the side of public.resource.org, the respondent in this case, because George, what, what benefit does Georgia get from keeping its laws restricted from copying? I don't even understand what benefit Georgia gets why are like why are they fighting this so much what are what do they stand to lose is it because they're gonna then not be able to have the same level of annotation from lexus because they 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 you know lexus is now not going to give it to them for the same price knowing that it can just be copied all over the place uh i don't know maybe that's the worst of it i, I still don't see why that's a why that's a bad thing for the citizen the citizen should still have access to the annotated code it's probably yeah maybe it's kickbacks from lexus Thank you very much to all of you for coming, all of you for watching. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you very much to our channel sponsor in October. Joshua Davis from Tanda Pay has sponsored us. Thank you for the support. Thank you to our $50 plus supporters, Joe Tyson, Aspernari, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Michael Pierce, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, Daniel Perez, Snorri Wizotsky, Black Leaf, and Benjamin Hytov. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters scrolling in front of me on the crawl. All of you are on the LED panel behind me and in the description of the videos below. Thank you very much for all your support as we take Brandon full-time. He's our full-time uh, editor now, and we are looking forward to the channel growing with us, with him, and with you. So thank you for your support. I'm going to let you go. I'll see you in the videos that drop. I love you all. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Bye.